Uh, thanks for coming. Um, this is the second time we've had Manu share his work with us. Today is, of course, a book release. The last time he spoke about his the first of the the first his first two books, at the loft, and kept us engaged for a long time. And uh, um, we decided that we needed a larger venue for for Manu. And he's he's just been uh, literally all over the country, uh, releasing his book in. I don't know, Cochin, Bangalore, Delhi, Hyderabad, I think. And uh, so he's here in Pune. Uh, welcome. Um, Manu Pillai is the author of the award-winning Ivory Throne, Chronicles of the House of Travancore, published in 2015, and Rebel Sultan's The Deccan from Khilji to Shivaji, published in 2018 by Jagannath. Formerly Chief of Staff to Dr. Shashi Tharoor, he, was, he has, in the past, worked at the House of Lords in Britain with uh, Lord Curran Billimoria and with the BBC on the Incarnations History Series. Written over six years and researched in three continents, Manu's first book, The Ivory Throne, won the 2016 Tata Prize for Best First Work of Nonfiction and the 2017 Sahitya Ac Academy Yuva Puraskar. Manu is also text contributor to Serena Chopra's Bhutan Echoes, published by Tasveer in 2016, and writes a weekly column for Mint Lounge. His other writings have, have appeared in the Hindu Open Magazine, the Times of India, Hindustan Times, and other publications. Manu studied here uh, in Pune at Ferguson College and is currently enrolled as a, as a PhD candidate at King's College, London. So as I was just saying earlier, Manu, um, we'd love you to introduce a book, talk about it, um, and then we'll do a conversation, and then... You can have the mic. There's, there's another mic. So again, thank you very much for your patience and for waiting for, for 30 minutes. I'm assuming some of you are very upset and angry, but you know, we'll, we'll sort that out peacefully and non-violently at the end of the program. I promise to answer all questions there are and make up for uh, my lapse of judgment as far as traffic was concerned in Pune. Now, you know, Kushu mentioned that the last time we were here uh, at the Loft Forum, we had a very, very long session. It was meant to be a one-hour session, and it went on for two hours or more. And I think Ushu had to break up the video into two parts and put it on YouTube. And I needed a little bathroom break in the middle. It was that long. So uh, this time he's given me very strict instructions to stick to about 25 minutes, after which I'm supposed to hand over the mic to him. So what I'll do is I'll introduce the book using merely the, uh, the title, which is The Courtesan, The Mahatma, and The Italian Brahmin. Now, usually, I mean, my last two books uh, had fairly short titles. The first one was called The Ivory Throne. And the second one was called Rebel Sultans. The idea was that these would be these names would have recall value. They were sort of catchy names that you could easily instantly conjure up in your head. It would conjure up an image in your head. So the Ivory Throne conjures up the image, something similar to the Peacock Throne, for example, of the Mughals. Uh, Rebel Sultans also has a certain ring. So going with the courtesan, the Mahatma, and the Italian Brahmin, a slightly serpentine title was partly out of choice because uh, at the end of the day this is a book of essays so it had to reflect all of the major themes and the, the kind of messages I was trying to convey through the essays and uh, it, it had a slight risk in the sense that we did wonder whether people, it, you can't turn into a hashtag for example because it's rather difficult for that although someone has tried and done it on Instagram but you know I wouldn't, I wouldn't go, that, go that far. But the idea was that the title communicates uh, a number of uh, important themes that I work on. So when I talk of the courtesan, what is the courtesan refer referring to? Now, you know, we're living in 2019. This is the 21st century. There's all this boom in technology and, you know, people are all woke and so on. And yet, we still, when we talk of history, we talk of uh, dynasties, we talk of kings, we talk of battles. But where are the women? Not enough work has been done to try and explain history through the eyes of women. And courtesans there are a very important medium because in a country that was where women didn't really get to write history or have very much by way of rights for many, many century, centuries, the uh, idea of the courtesan is important because the courtesan was literate. The courtesan was a creator of culture. The courtesan was a person who had a sense of self-expression, had a sense of agency and a body and mind that was not policed with the Mangal Sutra, which made the courtesan also some sort of a sexual threat in the Victorian era because people thought, who is this unmarried woman who's got autonomy, who's got economic resources, who's got mobility, and we don't trust this. So Victorian historians never thought that the courtesans were worth giving any kind of importance in a historical sense. You need heroes who could inspire, not courtesans and harlots and people who sang and danced. That was the notion they had. 
But look at the courtesan. So when I use the word courtesan in the title, the reference could mean it could mean any one of six or seven courtesans who appear in the book. So it could refer to a Begum Samru who began life as a dancing girl in Delhi in Chandni Chowk, pretty much raised in a brothel. And from there, she meets this German mercenary called the Butcher of Patna. Because, you know, if you've watched this show called Game of Thrones, there's a scene where um, a bunch of people are invited for a dinner at the end of a wedding. It's called the Red Wedding or something. And uh, the host basically cut everybody's throats. This was a man who actually did that in Patna in the 18th century. So since then, he was called the Butcher of Patna. So this lady goes off and becomes his concubine. Then he dies and she manages to not only edge his son out, but takes charge of his army. So overnight, the dancing girl from Chandni Chowk becomes the head of a mercenary army. In the middle, she has another uh, affair with an Irishman. Then she gets married to a Frenchman, nearly loses everything because the troops don't like her marriage to this Frenchman. So they say that we're going to tie you to a gun carriage and leave you to rot in the sun for a week. And they do that. She bounces back. Of course, the Frenchman ends up being killed, some say with her connivance. Uh, and she reclaims the loyalty of her troops. She goes on to become protector of the Mughal emperor. At one time when the Mughal emperor, on two occasions when the Mughal emperor was besieged, the people coming to his rescue were not his imperial forces. They were not his sardars. It was this ex-dancing girl from Delhi who actually came and protected Delhi and sort of took charge. So she was titled daughter of the Mughal emperor, pillar of the state and things like that. And by the end of her life, she becomes an ally of the East India Company and dies one of the richest women in North India in the 1830s. You know, she'd host parties, she'd host these big uh, mega socialite sort of events, etc. And people really valued the kind of person she was. So claiming that she did not have a contribution to make in history because she was a courtesan is a filter on our eyes rather than the actual reality on the ground. Another courtesan is Balamani of the 19th century. You know, in the 19th century, when most South Indian women are still illiterate, Balamani establishes a proper private limited drama company and using this drama company where she employs destitute women, Devdasi is disenfranchised by Devdasi legislation. She goes on to create a venture that is highly profitable. She sponsors public weddings, she constructs and renovates temples, basically things that kings do. But again, because she was an unmarried woman, because she was a Devdasi, she doesn't exist in our history. Uh, the courtesan could also refer to this, this you know, phantom rather than a real courtesan called Bhagmati, after whom you know, the legend, the founding legend of Hyderabad uh, it, it was, was created. She probably didn't even exist. There is no evidence that this lady actually existed. But her legend still sort of animates every tour guide you go to, to, to and meet in Hyderabad. They stand up and say Bhagmati, Bhagyanagar, that's how the city was named. And there's this wonderful romance, whereas there's no actual sense that this lady existed. But there again, there's a story. Uh, it could refer to uh, Goharjan who uh, was the one of the first women in India to record on the gramophone. So the point is these women have all made contributions, but because they were not holding swords and fighting battles, you know, men didn't quite uh, see value in their, in their perspective, value in their contributions. But even leaving courtesans aside, looking at women in their own right, you know, we tend to like women who follow the end of a sword and die gloriously on the battlefield because at least that allows a certain poetry to be created around them. But women who, with a sense of ambition, with a sense of personality, often tend to end up with the, with the short end of the stick. So we're sitting in Maharashtra, you know, there's this famous queen called Tarabai. Now, you, this assumption that women were all about pious domesticity is not true. Tarabai was a woman who understood power. She was a woman who stood up there when her husband had to flee. She learned how to, you know, conduct the government. She learned how to exercise power. She understood the nuances of court intrigue and so on. And for decades, she was an influence in Maharashtra. For several years, she was actually in power behind her son. Then she was imprisoned for many years. In fact, for decades, about 30, 35 years, she was out of the limelight. After 35 years, in, in the late 1740s, when there was a succession crisis, she glimpsed an opportunity to again come back into the limelight, took a nice little swing, and finally managed to invent a, a grandson who she had apparently secreted away and then recovers his grandson and makes another shot at power. She ends up losing because power is by, now this, by this time shifting to the Peshwas in Pune rather than to the Chhatrapatis who were in Satara and Kolhapur in Satara mainly. But the point is, this was not a woman who didn't know how to play the Game of Thrones in the Maratha uh, you know, politics of the time. She was a woman who understood power, she had cunning, she was shrewd, she was even capable of ruthlessness. But the point is, again, we like to focus on certain elements and the, not the other. Rani of Jhansi, everyone says she got on a sword and on, on, on a horse and went out to fight the British. But we forget that, like a lawyer, for several years she negotiated with the East India Company. She stood there, she wrote Persian letters, she argued out her case. It was when they didn't listen, when their so-called notions of justice, they themselves wouldn't apply to their own conduct. That is when she said, okay, you know, to hell with you, I'm going to go out, go out and do what I must. 
So again, there, there's a sense it, she wasn't merely some tragic heroine on a battlefield with this baby on her back. She was a woman who had a brain. She was a woman who actually stood out there and, like a lawyer, argued. In my recently, I wrote, and this essay appears in the book. It's about this woman in Kerala called Savitri or Datri of Kuredatta, which is the name of a family. Now, the Nambudri Brahmins in Kerala were a very orthodox community, and. Uh, you know, their, their men had tremendous power. One of the reasons was that unlike other Brahmin groups, the Nambudris never worked. Not till the well into the 1920s, Nambudris never went out and got jobs. They never felt the need to do it because they were big landed magnates. They had lots of property. Uh, the sad thing, though, is uh, their women were all treated pretty badly. They were not allowed a proper education. Many of them, they, depending on the subcaste, they were not allowed to wear gold ornaments. They had to wear pure white clothes. When they went out, they were the only women in Kerala to have parda. Not even Muslim women in Kerala were under parda, but Nambudri Brahmin women were, they, they couldn't be seen by anybody else. The most stringent rules, often they'd get married at the age of 13 to a 70-year-old man for whom this girl would probably be a fourth wife. Then the man would pop, and the, this, the result would be this girl would become the, a widow for the rest of her life. And being a widow in a Nambudri system wasn't very, very pleasant. So in 1905, there was a big scandal in Kerala where suddenly there's this lady called Kuredatta Savitri who's been discovered as an adulteress. So, you know, people say if she's an adulteress, she has to be tried. You know, there's, there's that typical process where a group of men come and it's a very ritualized trial. So they said, we've got to do all this. So she said, fine. But she said, if you're trying me, you also have to try the man involved. And they said, fine, you know, man involved, no big deal. Except that before they realized that she had a list of 66 names, 66 men she had had, had an affair with. And not only had she had affairs with them, she, had re she recounted dates based on what festival was happening. She had one of the characters was a, was a star of Kathakali at the time, which was basically like the Shah Rukh Khan of the day you know, in Kerala. And this Kaungar Shankarapanika, his name was. And uh, she remembered it on the basis of when he'd come to perform in that area. She used to go out in disguise because, you know, we, uh, on caste, for example, people assume that, you know, caste was merely this, this concept in terms of how people lived and what they ate and that sort of thing. But caste was also communicated through costume. So uh, depending on your caste, your hairstyle would change, the ornaments you wore changed, your clothes you wore changed. The result was she only needed to change her clothes and dress like a temple attendant woman and her own family wouldn't give her a second look because they'd assume she was a temple attendant. And she'd get out of the house like this and go ahead and, and have her affairs. It wasn't entirely her. People cast her now as some sort of goddess of revenge who was standing up for Nambudri women at the time. But it, was, it actually began with sexual abuse at the age of 10. The first person to have touched her was her own future brother-in-law when she was a 10-year-old girl. Her father was indicted in this. He, her her, her brother-in-law, her husband, various important people in Kerala society. And 66 names were taken. In the, and at this point, the Maharaja of Kuchin said that we've got to end this trial. And the story, of course, goes that his was the next name, which is why he wanted to end the trial. But the point is, this was communicated through the press. And the press, there are quotes in the Malayala Manura from Manurma from that time, where they say that she replied like a barrister, because she had kept her evidence, she had kept her records, and she knew that if she was going down, she's going to take all these people down with her. So, you know, we talk about Me Too in today's age. This is a, a person who can stand up and say, well, I did that first in, in 1905 when she was 23 years old. And after that, she disappeared and nobody knows where she went. Uh, very likely, she married. the story is that she married an Anglo-Indian, moved to somewhere in the Nilgiris and lived, lived the rest of her life on an estate quite happy and comfortably uh, for many, many years. It's quite likely she had children. It's quite likely she has descendants. But nobody knows where she went. All we know is that this trial took place and the records are still available. So the women are there in Indian history. We just haven't been looking at them. That is the first point with the courtesan. The second is the Mahatma in the title. Now... Looking at the Mahatma, you would imagine that I'm talking about Mahatma Gandhi. But the fact is, I'm actually talking about a man called Mahatma Phule. Because long before Gandhiji scandalized Western society by showing up in Buckingham Palace in a loincloth, it was Phule, Phule in Pune when the, when the grandson of Queen Victoria, the Duke of Buckingham, came here for a, a banquet. It was he who showed up in a torn blanket wrapped around himself, basically making the point that don't believe that the people you meet in this, in this banquet hall here are representative of India. The real India is outside on the streets. He was the man who made that statement. We've now somewhat very blandly uh, enshrined him as a social reformer and put him on a pedestal, but that in a way mutes the polemics and the radical thought that he also represented. You know, Pune was a very orthodox city because this is in Western India, in Maharashtra, it was the seat of uh, Brahminical power. You know, there were very high caste Brahmins, you know, competing claims on who's superior, but you have your Kokanastas and your Deshastas and it's a very uh, orthodox city. 
And so at one point when someone told Fule that, and this appears in his, in his Gulamgiri, he uses this as a dialogue, where he says that you know, when people claim that the Brahmins are superior because they were born from the head of the cosmic creator, he says, does that mean the, Brahmin men- the cosmic creator menstruated through the mouth? And he wasn't the first to say something like this. You know, a few centuries before him, Kabir, in a completely different part of India, uh, he said, well, if the Brahmins are all born from the cosmic creator's head, does that mean the birth canal was through the ear? Uh, you know, go back to the 12th century and you have Basava saying, loaded with the weight of the Vedas, the Brahmin is a veritable donkey. The point is not to hate on Brahmins, but the point is that custodians of caste, custodians who were of that order that existed, which was built on discrimination, there were always people in Indian history who stood up and challenged that. So Indian, our ancestors and our, uh, the people before us didn't just sit with their spines erect and think chase thoughts all day long. There were people who stood up and asked questions. There were people who argued. There were people with a polemical bent of mind. Now this happens, you know, in the uh, the the. There's a bhakti saint in Maharashtra called Janabai. And one of Janabai's poems starts with, uh, "God, my darling, won't you do me a favor and kill my mother-in-law?" God, my darling, won't you be a good God and also kill my father-in-law while you're at it? And then finally she goes on to include her sister-in-law in the roster of people she wants to kill. The irony is Janabai was not married. She was a kitchen maid in the, in the house of a more important or more well-known bhakti saint. But she was basically making a point that being a woman and being a maid, her lifelong sort of curse, I suppose, was to be stuck in domestic drudgery where she had so much more to say. She had so much more to express. And she did it through the vocabulary of God and bhakti. You know, Bhakti movement we often assume was about God and devotion, but we should not believe that devotion did not mean people managed to get polemical ideas or radical thought into that uh, through the name of God. In a way, I think, you know, uh, couching your, your radical thought with lots of words and references to God was a way to protect yourself, I suppose. But the point was these things to them didn't sit in, in, in contradiction. If you were a person who wanted to make a, a contribution, you were going to couch it in the vocabulary that people used at the time, which was devotion and God. But their, their thought was pointed, their thought was polemical and radical. They were people who were capable of standing up and asking questions. So that is what the Mahatma in the title refers to, you know, as far as I'm concerned. It could refer to Mahatma Gandhi also, because I have an essay on what if the Mahatma had lived. Because Gandhiji once said that you know, he wanted to live till the age of 125, and which meant he would have died around 1994, you know, after the Babri Masjid incident. So this is a, a slightly naughty uh, speculative essay where I try to see a, how he would have reacted to various political events of his time. For example, if the emergency happened and he said, oh, I'm going to go on a fast to death, would Indira Gandhi have said, fine, you know, go ahead. Uh, the 1962 war, would he have just decided to march to the border to sort of teach the Chinese a lesson in non-violence only to create more trouble for Nehru? Would he have become a problem for Jinnah? Because he once threatened to go and live, live in Pakistan for the rest of his life. So would he have become an international problem for Jinnah? So that one of the aspects of the essay is to try and, and you know, figure out how he would have responded to political events. But the other thing is also to see how we would have responded to him. Because the, the trademark of any society really is hypocrisy. And once you've used a person and milked that person for all that they've got, it's very easy to also forget people. Why is it that Indian history is so, of so many forgotten people? Because it's very easy to forget. When you're there and when you're in a position of influence, people remember you and respect you. Otherwise, they don't. So... Even uh, in the 1930s, we often assume that 1947 was when the first, after independence was when the first governments were formed in India. No, under the British constitution of 1935, there were Congress governments in eight provinces. As early as 1938, there was talk of corruption, of nepotism, of people, you know, ignoring party workers and giving their relatives and cousins and brothers and nephews uh, positions of importance in, in various local committees and things like that. These things existed even from the 30s. What Gandhiji wanted or what he envisioned for a future free India, India was not what Nehru and Patel and the younger generation wanted. So is it possible that into the 50s he would have become a little bit of a, you know, a, 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 an inconvenience for them? His death and the way he died is a very interesting thing because, you know, when his ashes were conveyed to different parts of the country on special trains, not only was the Indian Union's flag fluttering on these special trains, but also the flag of the Congress Party. Because the Congress Party was nicely sliding from a romantic freedom struggle into a party of power. So they needed the legitimacy that he was able to provide. And in a way, his death allowed him to be enshrined in a certain way and put on banknotes and then conveniently forgotten. So, you know, this is another thing I was trying to hint at with the Mahatma in the title. And finally, the Italian Brahmin, which refers basically to human quirk. As I said, our ancestors were not sitting with their spines erect and thinking chase thoughts all day long. They were quite capable of quirky, somewhat eccentric and very human uh, behavior. 
So, you know, Shivaji, everybody knows about because he acted largely in this part of the country, but he had a half nephew from his half sibling who established what was called the Tanjaur uh, Marathas, that branch of the Marathas, who are famous for having apparently invented the Sambar. As a South Indian, I deny this completely, but history is flying in my face, so I suppose I'll have to make my peace. So, uh, there was a nephew of Shivaji's called Shahu in Tanjaur. Comes to power as a 12 year old boy in, 17, in, the, in 1684. And sometime in the early 18th century, he writes a, a Telugu poem called Sati Dana Suramu. Now, this is a very interesting scenario to begin with because look, look at it this way we talk about multiculturalism, diversity, globalization, etc. Now, these things always existed even if the jargon didn't. So, in Tanjaur, this is a Maratha king who speaks Marathi at home when he's not inventing the Sambar. Uh, his people, his subjects of the state are all Tamilians, but the court language is Telugu, because Telugu had been given so much prestige from the time of Vijayanagar and later by the Nayakas who ruled in Tanjaur that they con continued the, to give Telugu patronance and so on. So when Shahu writes his poetry, it's in Telugu. And the Sati Dana Suramu is basically a parody on the caste system. It's this toppling of social conventions, where basically the, there's a chief character called Morobhatlu the Magnificent, who's this Brahmin who's going for a, a pilgrimage. And then on the way, he's going with his disciple, and on the way, he sees in the distance a very beautiful woman. So he says, stop, I must go woo her. And then the disciple says, no, no, Shastra, Dharma, Artha, all of that. But the man says, no, no, I don't want this insipid eternal bliss. I want the bliss that comes with spending a night with this beautiful lady. So then uh, the disciple has no luck convincing his, uh, his, his master. So the, they go there and they start flirting with this, this lady. But when she turns around, she's an untouchable. She's a Dalit woman. So she now starts spouting dharma, artha, and all the philosophical concepts. And the Brahmin says, no, no, give me your loins like you'd give a Brahmin a donation of land. And then she says, no, no, you see, you can't, uh, we can't have anything to do with each other because uh, I drink liquor and we eat cow's meat, we eat beef. So we're not pure enough for you. So the man says, we drink cow's milk and we worship the cow. You eat the whole cow, you must be purer than me. <laughs> now think, this is, this is Shahu, a Maratha king, saying this in the early 18th century. If a writer were to say something like this in a play today, you can imagine the kind of scandal it would cause. What has changed? The difference is that in his time, there was a certain cultural confidence, which we've lost since. We've become, in some way, an insecure, still trying to sort of pretend that what happened during the colonial age, which was the colonization of our lands, the colonization of our minds, and the colonization of, you know, and the toppling of so many systems and, and older orders that we had, that we still haven't completely gotten out of that, that sense of social insecurity. So we think that you know, everything must be pure, everything, there must be a pristine tradition. Tradition is not a pristine rock that you preserve for 1,000 years. It's an organic thing that breathes and gives and takes. The Hindus gave the zero to the world, they took other things from the world. That's how tradition and culture shapes itself. It's always responding to things in its own time. It's responding to the politics and the economics of its own time. So to, to pretend the tradition is some sort of you know, monolith that we must all protect is, is unhistorical. So the point is, Shahu was making a parody of the caste system in the early 18th century. This was a man who had a sense of humor. This was a man who was capable of asking some pointed questions. And these were not performed privately. This, was performed, this particular play was performed year after year after year uh, at a temple festival, which meant the people consuming it were people on the ground. Now, of course, in reality, they couldn't upset the caste system. But at least when they came to the temple, they had a moment of getting away from it and laughing at the whole thing. The point is, there were avenues to express yourself in different ways in the past. But the Italian Brahmin specifically refers to a character called Roberto de Nobili, who shows up in Madurai in 1606. This is a man who was born in Italy into a very aristocratic family. He's, he's got a holy Re Roman emperor in his family tree. He's related to a pope or two, very important figure. And uh, he decides to, he wants to become a missionary. His parents are flabbergasted because they say, who will continue the family line, like all in good Indian parents even today. So he says he runs away from home, gets a theological education, gets on a ship and comes off to Goa. Now, he doesn't quite like what the Portuguese, etc. are doing, so he wants to transfer to Madurai, where he comes by 1606. Now, for the first uh, six, 15 years in Madurai, which is under the Madurai Nayakas at that time, uh, he's had an older Jesuit over there who's been working and trying to convert with uh, such success that they've managed zero conversions in that time. And the only conversions they're managing are near the coast, which is all uh, fisher people and basically lower caste groups, which this chap shows up from Italy and he says, no, I don't, I don't want lower caste people. I want Brahmins to convert. So he says, I'm going to become a Hindu to save the Hindus. What does that mean? This Italian from, well, Monte Pulciano uh, starts wearing saffron robes, pretending he's a sannyasi. He acquires a sacred thread uh, and starts pretending he's a Brahmin. He starts uh, preaching the Bible as a kind of lost fifth Veda. 
the lost Roman Veda. He calls himself a Roman Brahmin. He learns Telugu, he learns Tamil, he learns Sanskrit, engages in debate with Brahmins. He starts eating out of a plantain leaf and only food cooked by Brahmins. So much so that he tells his colleague, the other Pujaiswit, please don't come near me when I'm eating because you'll defile my caste. The colleague complains to his superiors in Goa and then he's summoned angrily to Goa where he goes and he again tells his superiors, I can't eat with you, I'll talk to you but I won't eat with you. When they are very upset and they say you must cease and desist from all these actions of yours, this, this converting into a Hindu frame of, uh, of, of appearance, he uses his own family connections in Rome and gets the Pope to approve. So then obviously nobody can say anything. And this man, where there were zero converts, by the end of his career, there are about 5,000 odd converts in that area. And he travels, he gets a prince to convert, he gets uh, very, very many Brahmins to convert. He writes this interesting book on the South Indian gods, etc., which is a very interesting account of religion at the time in South India and so on. So this was a man who actually existed in Indian history, but you're not going to find such characters uh, talked about in Indian history. One of the reasons is that we are such a big and diverse country, and I said this at the last Loft Forum event as well, that... Textbook writers are often tempted to condense everything to these bare bones of five battles, five empires, five kings, and five dates. And I don't entirely judge them because it's not an easy prospect to include a country where, you know, you have matrilineal topless queens in Kerala and Go uh, Johar committing Rajput uh, women in, 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 in Ghungat in Rajasthan. You know, it's, it's the same religion, the same set of people, but in such different lifestyles in different parts of it. How are you going to include all this in one 50-page textbook for kids? So I have some sympathy for people like that, which is why my answer was to write a book called The Courtesan, the Mahatma and the Italian Brahmin and to tell everybody to read that book because then you would end up getting a richer, more nuanced understanding of Indian history beyond the textbooks that have in some ways reduced the subject to a very dull uh, prospect when in reality India's past is much richer, much more layered, much more complex and for that reason full of enough ingredients to give us a sense of, sense of cultural confidence, the sense of insecurity, the sense of feeling that any kind of change is a, is a Western uh, conspiracy to sort of destabilize Indian culture. No, if you look into India's past, there's plenty of uh, evidence of uh, things that would in fact scandalize us today. The Kama Sutra has been, there's an essay on the Kama Sutra in the book. The Kama Sutra we assume is all about bedroom gymnastics, but it's not. That's merely about two chapters in the Kama Sutra. Otherwise, the Kama Sutra is a little bit like the Artha Shastra for, for romance, where it says how to woo your, uh, the, the girl you like. Apparently, it's by getting hold of her wet nurse's daughter, who's supposedly her best friend. That is the method that is recommended. Elsewhere in the Kama Sutra, it says all cultured men, if they want to stick to being cultured men, they have to wax themselves every 10 days. Now, you know, tell that to men today and you know they, they wouldn't know that their own ancestors recommended waxing for men uh, it tells courtesans that you know get all the money out of your patrons but afterwards if they don't have money you know start stamping your foot and making foul expressions till that person leaves and it tells them never allow never you know take anybody uh, take the patronage of a man whose breath smells of crows which I have no idea what it means but it's there so the point is that even the Kama Sutra there's I mean, there's so much in it. You know, there's even very disturbing stuff. At one point it says, uh, you can't marry a woman without her consent. Another point it says, well, just drug her and then marry her. You know, so it's a very bizarre text. But even that one text alone can teach us so much about how people thought then or whoever wrote that, what he was thinking, and, you know, what he was on, things like that. And even that, by the way, it's not a joke. And when I was doing my first book, uh, and I, I think I mentioned this in the last, last loft thing as well, so it might be a repetition for people who were there. There's this character called Kerala Varma Velio Tamburan in Kerala. He's considered the father of Malayalam literature and the Kalidas of Kerala, a great Sanskrit scholar, a great Malayalam scholar. And today he's enshrined as this big literary figure in Kerala. And when I was doing my research for my first book in the archives, I found an 1870s letter written by him when he's in his late 20s. And he talks about how he was addicted to marijuana and bhang. And, you know, go to any kid well, in Ferguson College or in Symbiosis and ask them how many of them smoke weed. And you will get a, an answer that may startle your, your, the older people here. But the point is, kids then were doing it, kids now are doing it. In that sense, human beings don't change. The point is, if we start looking at history through the people without judging them, without influence, putting this moral lens saying that, you know, things have to be either good or bad. It's not about good or bad. A great king was still a great king, even if, they had, if he had a slightly, you know, uh, marijuana uh, addiction on the side. It doesn't take away from the greatness of what that person achieved. Why are we sitting in judgment on people of the past? That is another thing I'm trying to make through this point on human eccentric eccentricity and quirk.
work, which is that we are not here to judge people from the past. We are not here to sit and say that, oh, this was a good king, that was a bad queen. The point is, they were human beings, they had their own flaws and prejudices and weaknesses. And if we are sitting and judging them, tomorrow someone will judge us. And if we don't want to be treated that way, we have to extend that courtesy to the past as well. And I think I've exceeded my 25 minutes and Kushro is going to yell at me, so I'll put this mic down now. Spoke for 30 minutes, not bad. <laughs> Only five minutes over time. So what, um, what Manu uh, didn't say about the book is that uh, the book is a collection of uh, his essays that he wrote by, for the Mint. Not right? all, some. Not all. Some of them in, in other, other, in other uh, newspapers and magazines. And uh, they, the book is, do, is, a, se is a, a selection of 61 um, stories. Uh, split into two parts. One is uh, one set. The first part is uh, where the book is uh, talks of the time before, before, before the Raj, and then stories of the Raj. And there's also an afterword, uh, which is called titled "An Essay of Our for Our Times," and that we'll come to hopefully in this in this conversation. And Manu, I was, um, you know, your first two books are in-depth studies of parts of of you know distinct parts of history. This is a more broad. Um, uh, stories of d different aspects of, of India and also it's I feel it's your most political book in the sense that it's in the sense that it's you you've kind of taken a stand on some things and you've written um, uh, you know you you expressed yourself in it and we can come to that um, as as and you also worked you know closely with Shashi Tharoor you've been on, in on election campaigns you've worked you've written speeches for him uh, so you are in in that sense well connected with the story of Indian, po in Indian politics. And there's no better time to really discuss history um, than maybe even the last few days. I mean, you know, we, so many things are happening in our country and people are doing Google searches and looking up what things were and why things were. So uh, my question to you is, what is your agenda while writing? You know, do you, you, can you separate the po the, the po your political views from from when you're, uh, when you're writing on history? And what is, like, what is your, do you have an agenda? Is it hidden? Is it open? Um, where is your political stand? I think one just needs to be honest about things like this, which is that when you're dealing with history, you're, you're, when you're a historian, you're basically looking at it in a scientific way. There's a certain way you approach things where you don't allow as far as possible to your own filters to influence it. But at the end of the day, every historian is a human being, which means that even without realizing it, certain filters, certain lenses will fall on your gaze and will affect your writing. So anybody who claims to be 100% objective is, you know, probably lying because you can't be 100% objective. There's always that 5% window, which is why, you know, with the same material, one person may reach one conclusion, the other person may reach another. The question is how scientifically you've reached those con conclusions and how accurate your method is. So you make objectivity a goal and you try and aspire as far as, far as possible to be objective. But at the end of the day, can you give a guarantee that you're 100% objective? You can't. That's the, the plain truth of it. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing is a challenge that all historians face. Now you look at the past, I was talking about Victorian morality and the, the how historians back in the day didn't give women their due, didn't give courtesans their due, because they, they were looking at everything with a Victorian lens, where you know anything to do with an unpoliced woman, an unpoliced uh, sexuality was, uh, was taboo. So it was all about kings, it was never about these women, because they had that moral lens on their eyes. They didn't realize it, they were not doing it consciously, but it was there. Uh, 50 years ago, if you told historians that there's something called the feminist perspective in history, they wouldn't even have understood it. And I mean, you know, well-regarded names, like Jadunath Sarkar, for example, people would not have thought that the feminist view on history existed. But today, historians have to look at the feminist view. You can't avoid uh, doing that, and it's important. Similarly, 100 years from now, we will all be judged because there may be an LGBT uh, view on history. And that may be important because nobody's really looked at that angle in history. So as time passes, new perspectives come in and we have to therefore have the humility to acknowledge that what we are doing, a book I've written now, may be completely outdated in 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, who knows? It depends on how much material comes out, right? So as more material comes out, as new perspectives come out, our, our view of the past also changes. And of course, you know, you mentioned the politics. The politics also determines a lot of things, you know, and the mood and, you know, at, at some level, you know, why is it that intellectuals also always standing up and sort of saying things in, in moment, moments of crisis in democracies across the world? Because there is some sort of pressure they feel. The point, though, is never to be carried away 
with what you firmly believe because your truth may not be somebody else's truth. So I think you have to aspire for a certain balance. You have to aspire and fight it out. Fight out in the realm of ideas for what you believe in and fight it fairly with people on the other side as it were. But the point is always realize that your perspective may also be flawed because we don't know yet. We don't know what the full picture is. The future may bring new things to the, you know, to the limelight and that will change lots of things about how we look at the past. Reading this book, there, there are certain themes that keep, keep recurring. And, uh, you know, we're looking at the, in, the, the confluence of, you know, identity, identities of caste, uh, gender, and religion. And what is it about these three things that, have, has, that attracts you or that, you know, you constantly keep coming back to? And that, that's a constant theme in the book. I don't know, I have a, a certain affection for untold stories or people who have forgotten or people who have been footnoted in the past. And even my first book, it was about this Travancore queen who had been reduced to a footnote, some partly by her own relations because her, some of her policies and her actions were not uh, they, what they approved of. So she was written out of history that way. And I was very interested that, you know, why is this woman, partly, of course, because she's a woman. It's easier to write out women because, you know, there aren't, A, history is largely be written by men with the result that most women, if they've been mentioned at all, it's usually in a, with a sense of charity rather than with a sense of actually giving them their due. So I think I was attracted to that, telling a story that hadn't been told, giving expression to a voice that hadn't been allowed to fully express itself at that time. But again, not without, with any sort of moral romance about it, it was just something that interested me. Even my second book, The Deccan Sultans, it's partly because there are dozens and dozens of books on the Marathas, there are dozens of books on the Mughals, but between the Maratha era and the Mughal era in the Deccan, there were these various largely Shia sultanates that existed in the Deccan, and they have a splendid sort of history. They've made contributions. They've actually shaped the way castes emerged here, the way religion emerged here. A Shivaji emerged at that time on that platform because that platform was established by others in a certain way. You know, so all of this built up and led to something that we, we give uh, a lot of attention to. So I was again interested in that story that was, that was not told in that sense. So it was told only uh, by a small set of academics. A very important person is, one of them is sitting here. So it was, it, was, it was stuck in that realm. And I was like, more people should study about this. When I grew up here in Pune, you know, in our, class, in our class books and our textbooks, we'd only hear of these cameos. One Nizam Shah, you know, in, in one corner somewhere in a reference to Shivaji's grandfather. One Adil Shah in some other corner. And you're like, who are these people? Why are they only these cameos here and there when they were actually in power at the time? These are people who shaped society at the time. Why, why don't we have a fuller picture of them? So the second book was again to bridge that gap between academia where there's great work happening on the Deccan Sultans with a large audience saying that, by the way, you should come and invest in this, in this interesting, splendid space. And the third again, uh, again, these forgotten female characters because they haven't been given their due. A lot of the Bhakti saints, including the, the lower caste Bhakti saints, Chokamela, for example, you know, people like that because again, these are stories that need, I think, a more mainstream uh, dissemination for the simple reason that the point I made earlier, they were all asking questions, they were all expressing thought that in their own time was considered radical. And now when, you know, so much of our thought is being policed, it's important to realize that our ancestors also, they were capable of standing up and asking questions. So I think that I wanted to uh, highlight there. And, you know, the other thing is gender, caste and human eccentricity. These are, that's the third thing that uh, animates my research, which is just to find that human element, that human quality in people. Because for me, understanding history as a, as a thing of, as a, not about monuments and buildings and battles alone, but also about the people who wanted to build those monuments. Very, every time a king builds a monument, he's trying to leave a stamp on, of, of his presence, of his accomplishments over there. That, that human urge to sort of leave behind something saying, I was here. That is something that interests me, because why is it that human, humans act in a certain way? Humans acted in, in and th that's the funny thing, right? You find that their impulses are the same across time. So in the Peshwa records, they have something called the Kotwal records, which are the Peshwa's police records from the 18th century. And there's this interesting record where uh, it's a woman who accuses her father-in-law of trying to rape her. And the father-in-law's uh, uh, defense in court is, oh, I was on the way to the bathroom and I tripped and fell on her by accident. Now, the funny thing is, in 2011 or something, there's a Saudi diplomat in London who tried to rape somebody. And his defense in court was, I was on the way to the bathroom, I tripped and fell. So when I read this, I was like, there's 150 years separating these two events, but the defense is the exact same thing. On the way to bathroom, tripped, fell. You must have read your book. <laughs> no, no, this was before. So the point is, human beings act in certain ways. This, this whole notion of putting them in pedestals as gods, when they were also flawed, when they were also human, that is something I want to challenge for the simple reason that understanding them as humans connects us to the past better. 
they're not people who existed on some other planet. They didn't wake up in the morning thinking, ah, you know, golden age. They were the ones who, you know, in their own time went about their business, but went about it with a certain confidence, went about it with, uh, and, and did things, which is why we now, you know, look at them as interesting beings. But they were like you and me, you know. Uh, I, I don't think 50 years from now I'll be given that sort of treatment, but the point is, you know, that connects you to the past better. Looking at the past through the people connects you better. And I think it's important to understand your past. Because otherwise, you know, so much of even today's battles are all fought about what happened 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. And, you know, to think that the past is something you can completely ignore in the present is not, it, it's not correct. Because the past informs everything that happens in the present. Even this, uh, the, the 370 re repealing, it's based on something that happened in history. It's based on something that hope happened over the past few decades. That history is important, right? So it's important to understand the past. And we get a fuller picture of the past, not by looking at it merely as these sanitized figures on pedestals, not by looking at it merely as battles in kings and queens, but in a complete format where you look at the architecture, you look at human interactions, you look at the lower caste, you look at the upper caste, you look at court culture, you look at international trends at the same time, and then you get a bigger picture. Then you get a, something resembling a complete picture. You will never get a complete picture, but something close to that. Since you brought this up, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today is in the last week, you know, there's been a lot of turmoil happening in, in, on, in the media, in the news, and talking about 370, 35A, talking about Kashmir. Um, so there's been, there's been, at least on the, social, the, the little social media that I'm on and the things that I read, there's been debate, discussion how, of what happened, how it happened, why did it happen. Uh, there has been there has been questions of you know is was this legal was it constitutional was it democratic uh, we have people saying that there was no there was no other choice this had to be done uh, we tried all other options discussions debates um, there was some people saying that you know uh, why did you do it with so much force why did you do it with com communication blackouts why was it done secretly some com some commentators have even questioned India's legal status now that you know with with thirty uh, with three seventy being removed are we even legally uh, tied to Kashmir anymore. Um, on the one hand, we've got a former CM who you know, broke down on camera and said, you know, uh, why has our state been divided on, part partitioned on you know, religious lines? And on the other hand, we have a former Mac a recent Magsasay Award winner who says, you know, Ladakh has been wanting separation and has been wanting its own identity. So there are two sides to this. So I wanted to know what your views on this. What, what, you know, do you think that what happened is wrong? Do you think it could have been done differently? What is your stand? You've been in the, in the political spectrum for a while. and Yeah, I mean, this is the thing with right or wrong, right? It sort of simplifies things that are so complex where it's... Is there, any, is there a question of right and wrong in this? Or? It's, it's more complex. The thing is, because I've worked there, because I've worked in parliament, etc., I've seen how these backroom negotiations work. I've seen how much, if you want something here, you have to give something there. It's, it's this tug... Of, of, of war between people and there's so much giving and taking that happens in the process and it's not easy to do that. What change by itself is not something that worries me. Change by itself is not something that I think is a calamity but I think I agree with the point that how change is done in a democracy matters. And I think putting a state on lockdown is A, not a good sign. I mean, there may be security reasons, only the people in power know that. But I don't think you cannot claim to be doing something constitutionally when the people who have been given a constitutional mandate are locked up and put under house arrest and the entire state is under curfew. And the reason I say this is not because of this here and now. This, these things have happened in the past. Let us, let's not be under any impression that this is something, something new. The, the problem with governments is any decision that a government takes sets a precedent. And that is why governments have to act with great responsibility. Anytime they do anything, there is a reason why we're a democracy. These democracies are slower. They're more difficult to work, but they have to be worked that way because everything you do has a certain repercussion in the future. So, for instance, uh, you know, there's that case of Indira Gandhi abolishing the privy purses of kings in, in, the 19, in 1971. Uh, initially, she tried, the Supreme Court put it down, then she got legislation through. Now, she got legislation through, it was done constitutionally, but to think of it in the historical sense, in 1949, when the states integrated, this was a constitutional promise given to the states. This may have been a minor promise. You know, it affected only uh, 465 families across the country. So she would have thought it didn't matter. But once you break a constitutional promise, you've, create, you've put that little wedge over there, which other people in the future can really, you know, 
blow up and start tearing things down as they like. Which is why any action done by a government has repercussions not just for now, but also 20 years from now. This may have been done with the best of intentions in mind. As I said, change by itself is not something that bothers me. But the point is by doing it in this way, you open the door to a potential future government doing similar things. They'll be tempted in the future. You know, they'll, they'll be tempted because this has now set a precedent. You, 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 democracy is not merely about the letter of the law. It's not merely about constitutions and what the constitution's text says. There's also something called the soft guardrails of democracy, which is basically usage and custom. So the president has lots of rights on paper. The Queen of England has lots of rights on paper. They don't even have, well, it's not even written on paper. But she won't actually go and use those rights, right? Because that is understood. Usage prevents her. There's no law that's written down saying she can't exercise those rights. But usage and custom and convention prevent her from doing that. Which is why it's not merely what is on paper. How you conduct yourself in interpreting that also matters. Because that opens up ways for other people. So for me, the decision by itself is not the issue. How that decision was arrived at is the issue. Because you can go ahead, you can change. This has been drifting for 70 years. Sure, people who say that, how long are you going to let this go? They have a valid point in that. People who worked in that security space, you know, people in think tanks, etc. you talk to them. They'll give you 20 reasons for why this had to be done. But if you're looking at it from a constitutional democratic point of view, it could have been done in a slightly different way. But again, people in power have to look at various things. One is international uh, you know, repercussions or international context. Now, they're looking at partly what is happening in Afghanistan with the US withdrawal. They're looking at what's happening in Pakistan, the comeback of the Taliban, la la la. They're looking at their, our northern neighbors in China. They're looking at a bunch of other international factors while they're looking at this. It is not merely a domestic uh, issue in that sense. But all that put aside, for me, it's the, it's the method rather than the, the conclusion. The conclusion by itself could have been arrived at Given some more time, it could have been arrived at perhaps in a, in a different format. For me, the, this opens up a precedent that I'm very uncomfortable with. More than right and wrong, I'm very uncomfortable with the way this was done. Because now it opens up an option for future governments. Maybe not this one, but 20 years from now, you know, you, you can start do, doing these legal gymnastics with the constitution where technically you're within the letter of the law, but you're completely flouting the spirit. I think that is dangerous, and that is how democracies eventually start getting shaky. Because it's not merely about sticking to the rule on paper. It's also about what the rule intends in spirit. How do you see this uh, affecting the geopolitics of that space? You know, Pakistan, China. Uh, does it, do you think it can affect the rest of India in some, in some ways? Or? I mean, I, I, it'll affect them. Clearly, look at the kind of mandate it's got in Parliament. Again, it's passed through Parliament. Clearly, it's a very popular move. In t at least the MPs like it. Within the Congress party, officially opposed to it, but so many of their younger MPs, so many of their uh, you know, leaders in different parts of the country have come out saying they, they're happy with it. My ex boss Shashi Tharoor, on a program yesterday, talked about how he's, he doesn't have issues with what was done. Again, the way it was done is what the issue is. So I would, I would only stick to that. What the bigger picture was, only people in the know really know. Like They're the ones who took the decision. They're the ones who know what they're looking at. They're the ones who are looking at these international threats and problems. These things change very rapidly. I was last involved in all this in 2017. And I know from previous experience that in a year, a lot can change. And that is it's tricky territory. But that's also why it's, I mean, the point though is that governments will always have these external pressures. Despite those exper external pressures, surviving and keeping your democracy intact, that is a real responsibility. And that's why someone like Nehru succeeded. He had all his flaws. He was banning books by the 50s. He was being fairly authoritarian in the Northeast with the army and so on. He had his streak of illiberalism as well in terms of his actual actions as a leader of a state. But despite that, he tried his best to sort of make sure that as far as possible, we would not compromise on democratic convention. And that is important, I think. And that, that, that finding that tightrope walk and doing it in the right way, I think that makes a lot of difference when you're a government. You're not a, a bunch of thugs in a room, you know, pushing people over. That's, that may be your private affair or whatever. It may be a small scale thing. You're the government of India. You're creating a precedent for the rest of the country and for generations to come. That is why I'm uncomfortable. I do, I'm not so concerned about the international issues and all of that because they know better. That's not uh, something, you know, people like me can comment on. But what I'm uncomfortable about is the, is the method and the format because it is not, it doesn't sit well with the kind of, you know, uh, ideas that are, that are enshrined in the Constitution. And I think that is something we need to think about. Um, at the end of the book, you've written this essay called An Essay for Our Times. And it's, it's about um, your idea of what our, our national identity is and what, it, what, it, what many people try to define it as and finally what our Constitution, def our, co our constitution defined it as and, what, and your, your view on, on where we are today. And I wanted to quote uh, one of the uh, uh, a, a bit from one one essay, which is called uh, 
This essay is called Savarkar's Thwarted Racial Dream. And I'm going to quote. In the end, history didn't quite play out in the way Savarkar and his, conf and his confederates theorized. Despite obituaries and shrill pr prophecies of danger, India became a secular democracy and not a Hindu Rashtra. And in perhaps what might have caused the father of Hindutva to recoil in horror, it was not the Nepali, the Nepali dynasty of Savarkar's academical premise that soared to power in New Delhi. What Savarkar env envisioned in 1940 was a future emperor of India. What India got in, in a decade instead was a, was a people's constitution, defended by men and women who broke no kings and shunned all empires. Do you think that's in threat today? No, I think, see, words like threat and all I find uh, are a little too stuck. The thing is, uh, you know, uh, if you look at history, you see patterns constantly. The world will spinning today, it'll keep spinning tomorrow. But the point is, we have to be on our guard. We have to be definitely involved, we have to be part of the conversation. But I don't think we should succumb to these shrill notions of the world is ending tomorrow, everything is in danger. No, I mean, it's a big country, it's a diverse country. If something, if it catches fire in one, in one end of the country, there's enough water at the other end to come and put it out. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated country. You still have communists ruling in one part of the country, you have socialist, you know, we have our constitutions will say socialism is in another place. We still pay pensions to princes, even today, by the way. It's not merely Indira Gandhi abolished the privy purses, but we still have officially recognized princes in the country who get uh, money from this republic, uh, this, this secular social uh, republic of India. They still get their incomes from the government. There's lots of irony in this country. So I don't think words like threat, speaking entirely from a historical lens, they don't appeal to me because they put things in too stark boxes and that's not how human society works that's not how politics works and that's not how the world works it's not so stuck we often think in the world of the internet and twitter and social media that people are polarized in this in this mega unbelievable way but in reality people have various reasons for who they vote for and why so for example you know in the congress party is you know, is basically dying in most parts of the country why is it this they're still a fighting force in kerala because they still have their grassroots strong look at the bjp a lo lot of people are not voting because they want Gaurakshaks to come and sort of hang around with them. They don't want their daughters' bodies to be policed and told what to wear, etc. They're there because an RSS worker will help an old lady go get her old age pension. That lady is grateful for that service delivered. It has nothing to do with ideology. It has nothing to do with ideas and constitutional values. It is entirely to do with how much in touch you are with the people on the ground. So. When people say threat, you know, this party versus that party, we're ignoring a lot of the complexity about how parties actually work. And successful parties, you can't blame a party for doing politics well. You know, if they've, if they've gamed the system, they've gamed the system. People have tried this in the past. Everything, I mean, that's the funny thing, right? When Narendra Modi came to power, I thought he would become, or at least I thought he was trying to become the BJP's Nehru. But increasingly, the, 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 armor, the armory that they have seems to be more Indira Gandhi's rather than Nehru's in terms of how they're acting. But all this has been done in the past. At that time also, we said threat, end of democracy, all of that. Things bounce back. There is a way, there are, there are checks and balances built. It is true that with lots of communication, with lots of the media basically going flat and in, in, in prostration with, the, with those in power, etc., there are some threats. These soft guardrails of democracy are weakening. That is true. But I don't think it's the end of the world. I don't think it's uh, something we need to be paranoid about in some sort of existential uh, way. I think there are ways to fight back. And I think people are. You know, I think people can still gather in a room like this, can still put out ideas that people in power may not like. And the point is you can do it. There are people being victimized, there are people who have to face the brunt of the state, etc. But there are still enough avenues, there are still enough states. There are states which are standing up, for example. You know, you go to Kerala, it's a completely different culture there. You can basically get away with saying whatever you want in Kerala. You can even eat, eat whatever you want in Kerala. So, you know, there's, that state exists in the same country. So, the, anything that is too simplistic, I have, I have issues with, and I don't think it, it works that way. And if you make the effort to talk to people you know, on the right, as it were, you'll find that they, they have a logic too, and there are ways you can talk. There are, this breakdown of debate, this polarization basically puts an end to debate, and that is what is dangerous. When you firmly like, sort of dig your heels and saying, I will not budge, I'm sorry, in a democracy, you have to give and take. It's consensus, compromise. As I said, you want something there, you have to give something here. And that applies to everybody across the board. It's easy on social media to make a grand statement and sort of grandstand and you know, talk about principles, etc. because it's on social media. You, know, you put your money where your mouth is, you realize you go out into the real world and it's compromise and consensus and talking to people. 
So merely because, you know, the, after this Kashmir thing, I saw a number of uh, status updates of friends that started saying, oh, I've deleted 50 friends from Facebook because they supported the government's move. I was like, really, deleting 50 friends is your answer to this? You know, the point is you have to engage. You can't delete your friends. So they will delete you, you will delete them, and what? Uh, what are we building for tomorrow? And then we'll all sit on social media and complain that democracy has come to an end. You're not talking. You're not willing to engage. How is this going to move forward? You look at history, it is always give and take. It is always that way. Even with the British, Gandhiji went for the roundtable conferences. You know, he, at certain moments, he acted in ways that may now, you know, people certain judge saying that was wrong, this was right, etc. But the point was at that time, that is what was needed. At that time, he needed to go there to be able to patch things up a certain way. He got along with some vi viceroys like Lord Irwin, because Lord Irwin was a very religious man. One was an imperialist, one was a nationalist. But they connected on that common plane of religion, and they managed to hammer out what was called the Puna Pact. You know, so th there are there are ways in which uh, this can work. So it depends entirely on how much you talk, how much you engage. This polarization you see in social media is actually damaging. This grandstanding and holding up your flag and thinking that you're doing a service to democracy is, I think, very short term. In the long term, you need to talk, you need to engage. When people say something, it's not something they pull out of thin air. It's coming from a legitimate source of some grievance or the other. It's coming from a place that they think is legitimate. If they think it's legitimate, it's, it's our business also to talk and to find out why do you think it's legitimate. You have to understand different views. You have to understand what the other side is saying. Only then can you move forward. You know, denying that completely is, is romantic and grand and will give you a wonderful set of likes and, you know, 150 likes on social media or whatever. But I don't think it serves any purpose in the, in the long run. And I think that is important to, to note. What, what are the avenues to have these discussions at? What, I, I mean, social media is one, but it's clearly, clearly not effective. I was thinking today, where do we, are there, what are the platforms? Are there platforms, are there places, are there spaces uh, where we can actually talk about history, where we can actually talk about, in a, uh, I mean, this is a book launch. We're talking about politics. I mean, um, what, is there something in, that, you, that you think that, that it already of... happens. So, for example, you know, there was this time a few, I think one or two years ago, they wanted to introduce uh, cameras into the committee meetings in Parliament. So, there's a Foreign Affairs Committee, Public Accounts Committee, there are all these committees, and they said, let's introduce cameras into the committee meetings. And practically all the committees said no. Because there are cameras in the main Lok Sabha, that's why everybody stands up and makes their grand speeches and pretends that, you know, they're all enemies of each other. But in the committee meetings where there are no cameras, where the doors are shut, they actually get work done. Because there is, there's nobody watching them. They're, none of their constituents are sitting there waiting for them to grandstand. They actually get work done. There they talk. There they actually get business transacted. Within that building, we on TV see this, this sort of sloganeering and the people going into the well and disrupting parliament and all of that. That same day, they'll have a committee meeting and they're all still there happily sip their chai and get, you know, uh, 20 issues handled. And that's done on a, on a cooperative basis. That exists in parliament. That mechanism is already there. And which is why it's dangerous, right? So which is why when social media polarizes and give this Im gives this impression that, oh my God, everything is in the stark two categories, it ends up having an eff effect on that also. Because people then start worrying about, you know, cooperating there. Will they be betrayed by somebody who go and say that you said this in private, etc., etc.? All of this creates problems. But the avenues are there. We just have to reinforce those avenues. We have to reinforce the ways in which we engage, the ways in which we go out and meet people. And Social media is great for, you know, connecting, learning about the world, for news and this and that. But I think there is something to, for, the, for the real encounter, things like that. This sort of, sort of audience, this sort of format is, I think, much better for actually getting to understand people. There's a new biography of Savarkar coming out. You read that bit on Savarkar there. I'll give a little bit of context on that essay. It's, uh, in 1940, Savarkar wrote this somewhat strange essay where it was actually in response to a press person asked Gandhiji saying that, you know, to prevent partition, which by then the Muslim League had started asking for partition. So he said, um, the press person said, you know, what, how far will you go to prevent partition or something? And Gandhiji said, you know, we'll take the Nizam of Hyderabad, make him the emperor of India, so that the Muslim emperor of India, and we'll stay united or something. And this gives Savarkar this great sort of rage, and he says, no, 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 the Nizam can't be the emperor of India, the ne king of Nepal will be the emperor of India. And he wrote this very interesting op-ed uh, in, a, in a newspaper where he talks about how the Nepalese army will come down from the Himalayas basically towards Delhi. All the princely states in India will gather their forces and join this grand enterprise for Indian freedom. And they would create like this, this all the proper Indian princes and the, and, under the king of Nepal. They would be, they'd create a new order for India. It didn't pan out, obviously. The Indian princely states were ruled mostly by men who were dissipated and more interested in their champagne and their uh, parties and their tours abroad than with building armies and helping Savarkar realize his dream. And it's not an essay he later stood by as such. Like, he didn't really raise this. It was a one-time thing. But I found this essay really interesting that Savarkar had this 
the sort of idea that you know the, there could be a Nepalese emperor of India. You know what happened to the the royal family of Nepal? It would have been, you know, the news would have said emperor of India shot by his nephew or whatever. So that was the that was the context of that essay. And now telling you the context, I've forgotten what your question was. <laughs> we, we were just chatting. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned this new biography of Savarkar. In fact, so there's a new biography of Savarkar yeah. coming. In fact, two: one by Vaibhav Purandare and the other by Vikram Sampath. And I think it's worth reading these books because if you, I've, I've read the manuscript of the Vaibhav Purandare one, it's very interesting. It brings so you know people often make a hoo ha about his mercy petitions, saying that Savarkar wrote mercy petitions. All the others they were actually fighting, and you know he wrote a mercy petition. But you actually read about those years that he spent there. This was a man who went in at some 65 kilos. He's reduced to 43 or 44 kilos in a matter of months. So that tells you a lot about the kind of conditions in jail. And for me, he wrote mercy petition, therefore he equal to bad, is not an argument I, I'm very comfortable with. Again, because this whole bad, good, bad, good dichotomy is something I don't like. In his context, at that time, he wrote a mercy petition. He got out and he went ahead to, he went on to create a, a, a new vision of Hindutva and all of that. He wrote his books. Prior to being imprisoned, by the way, he was a great uh, proponent of Hindu-Muslim unity. If you read his book on the 1857 rebellion, which he calls the first war of independence, he talks about how Hindus and Muslims are sons of the same mother and things like that, about how, the, how he approves of the Mughal emperor's proclamation at the time and things like that. There is a sense of wanting to build bridges. And there is a theory that uh, in, in prison, for example, the prison guards were all Muslims. And because of the way he was treated, that apparently triggered some sort of personal animosity. Now, this may be too simplistic, but the point is, if you read these books, you get a sense of where that man was coming from. And if you want to understand Hindutva, you have to understand you know, the mind of the man. Clearly, simply saying he, he wrote mercy petition, he's bad, we're not going to engage with him. I don't think that serves any purpose. You have to understand the man who created that vision. You have to understand a man that, that's created a vision which now really has serious political power with it. If you really want to deal with it, understand it first. No? Uh, sitting in judgment on it doesn't yeah, So help. talking about understanding, I got a call from Jagannath um, and they sent me the un, unverified copy or the unchecked copy of Savarkar's new book by Purandari. So we have an invitation to call him and it would be great if you could uh, uh, you know, it, have a conversation with uh, Webhav. I'm certainly not qualified enough to talk, talk with him, but okay. it would be great. Um, so now let's, let's talk about you know, your writing and your book. Um, you mentioned that uh, it's it's for me it's curious you know you've got such a diverse range of topics so and you mentioned that whenever you're researching something you have your own word file you write down things but you write down you said you write down quotations you know you write down um, uh, what's the word um, uh, what people say is it quotes uh, no yeah you 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 basically type out quotes you know from your from from whatever you're writing and you've got say you've got you said you you've got twelve thousand words on Jinnah. And when you feel you when you when you're kind of lost about what to write about, you go back to your notes. So can you talk talk about a little bit? Little bit that's about just you know. I mean, the the more information you have, the clearer the picture you form of the past. And I think that's just a, my method is fairly old fashioned. Now people have new technologies about how they, you know, condense their research and catalog it and all of that. I still stick to my word documents where I painstakingly type everything in and sort of let it stay there. Then go back to it later, digest it properly, etc. But when I'm working, it's really like a machine. You know, borrowing large chunks of various documents and books, etc. The Savarkar thing I found in the archives. There's another one. Uh, so in this book, for example, now if you look at the source material, some of them come straight out of the archives. There's one on the on the Vellore mutiny, for example, which where I've largely report, re referred to a parliamentary report that uh, that went into this Vellore mutiny afterwards. Vellore mutiny takes place in the early 19th century, where the British, long before the 1857 rebellion, their own troops in Vellore, you know, sort of stand up and have a organize a revolt. And the interesting thing is that the revolt was largely because the British had decided to tamper with the uniforms of these, these soldiers. They basically said, all your moustaches now must be standardized, your hats will all be the same, and you'll all have to basically start looking pretty much in the same way, all these men. What they didn't realize was they thought they were basically merely changing a few cosmetic things about uniform, standardizing the appearance of their troops for discipline and sort of, you know, uh, looks that, that they, they, they looked a certain way. What they didn't realize was that in India, costume had a lot to do with custom, which had a lot to do with caste. So the way a man twirled his moustache gave away his caste. Where he kept his choti in the front or the back or on the side, all of that determined what caste he was. The kind of hat he wore, the kind of turban he wore, gave away his caste. So when they were all told to wear similar hats and you know, pull down their moustaches and shave it in a certain way, they thought they were all being converted to Christianity. So then they have this revolt and the British are so embarrassed that this whole revolt, this whole bloodshed was caused by a matter of uniforms and moustaches and facial hair and uh, hairstyle that they later basically concocted a conspiracy saying Tipu's family, Tipu's sons basically orchestrated this revolt because they happened to be in the fort at the time. The family had nothing to do with this. It was merely because the British had tampered with caste. 
So that sort of thing comes out of the archives. So there, you know, going into the archives and trying to discover these these little gems is is an interesting thing in its own right. Then a lot comes from wide reading. You know, you read books of people who've done a better job than you of uh, of, of you know sifting through material. Uh, you know, he, you've got a, an expert here who's gone so many times to the Nizam X or the late Nizam Shahi capital and written so much about the architecture there. You've written so much about the 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 kind of you know ideas that eventually motivated the architecture, how they lived there. So much through architecture. Now I'm not an architecture an art, uh, historian of architecture, but I can go into that book and derive a lot from there because someone else has done that, right? So some of it comes from great books like that, and then you know some of it also. In my first book, a lot also depended on interviews because you've got your archival material. But if the characters you're dealing with are people who are who passed away recently, there are people who knew them who are still alive. So my first book is on the Maharani of Travancore, and her son-in-law is still alive, and he's 103 years old in Bangalore. And this man was born during the First World War. When he was 21, he was standing on the street when the Maharani's daughter saw him from a palanquin and said, "Ah, I like him. I want to make him my husband." And then overnight, this science student discovered that he was going to become royal husband. So he was taken to the palace, uh, given a, a, a course and. Uh, how to eat with a fork and knife, and you know, got suits tailored and taught how to sit on a horse and things like that. Uh, given a lesson in sex education because you can't make make love to princesses as you like. There's a certain format. Uh, for example, you can't expect the princesses to do certain things. So you know, and that the priest, it's a family priest who tells them what to do and what not to do when you're making love with a royal princess. Uh, that happens to him. Then World War Two happens. Uh, meanwhile, you know, after marrying this princess, he's got all the time in the world because he, now he doesn't need to find a job. So he's painting, he's learning music, and, you know, really making the most of that palace environment. Then independence comes, and they're like, "Oh no, you know, the kingdom doesn't exist." So then they move to Bangalore. He sets up a series of companies and sort of lives a different life with the Vital Malias of the world, the presidents, governors, that sort of life. And he's still alive at 103. You know, in Bangalore, in that old colonial house, this man still lives. This is a man who's seen the world from World War One. Till today, till the dawn of the internet, you know, the internet, IT age, etc. That person is, I mean, for me, when the book came out, you know, that old back black and white photos of him. But when I actually went there to give him the book, I realized, my God, you're a character in the book, and you're still here, you know, you're still here, sitting here, having seen all this with your own eyes. So some, you know, material you also get that way, and it's putting all this together that really gives you, as I said earlier, a complete picture of the past. So it's a fun process, really, going into the archives, going into libraries, spending 12 hours a day, distracting yourself on Instagram with wild Instagram updates and stories, because you know that's your only distraction. Otherwise, for 12 hours a day, you're stuck in a library saying nothing to anybody, because nobody talks in libraries. So all you have is silence and your work. And when that silence and your work, you end up working. So Manu, what, what next for Manu Pillai? What, what's, what's on your mind and what are you working on and what's, what's your next book? I'm superstitious about talking about things that have not been done yet. But uh, I've done my research for my next book. I'll start work on it hopefully sometime early next year because all of the rest of the year I've got plans. So early next year I'll probably sit down and start working on it, which will take me at least a year and a half or two to finish. And then, yeah, when the book is published, I will send you an email and we will do another event at the Loft Forum. <laughs> And next time I'll come on time, I promise. Yeah, hi Manu, finally meeting you uh, with a lot of messages and finally back in Pune. Feels like home for you, right? Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, sure. The traffic S certainly made me feel like it was home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no questions about Pune and the, you know, the Peshwas and everything, but you know, uh, th there is a certain uh, character in one of the founding fathers who laid the foundation of a modern India, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, when I kind of read his books, uh, early adult age, so I said, who's going to be a politician and a leader and a prime minister with such intellect? And I don't think anyone is going to, you know, be a inheritor of those. Then uh, some decades along came Dr. Shashi Thuru. And uh, you've been there, done that, we've hosted at PLF. Uh, then I have always started thinking, okay, after Dr. Shashituru, God willing, he would probably live a hundred years, God bless. But after Shashituru, who? So I was al already started worrying, but I don't have to worry now because Manu is here. <laughs> Given the way our politics is going, I'm not entirely sure this is something I want to jump into. But thank you. for I take that as a compliment. Thank you. So, so only the P is missing from your catalog. Ah, we'll wait for this day. I hope it will be at least 25 years from now. 
I, I keep you know. whenever I speak to Manu on the phone or on text, I say, you know, Manu, you're a you're a rock star, you're a superstar. So I think that you got that right there, you know, like from your audience. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Manu. Uh, I want to ask about your writing routine. Like, what is the discipline that you follow? How many hours do you put in? And most importantly, how do you get yourself to write when you have to write and you don't want to? Yeah, you do a lot of bad writing. Frankly, that's the only way. Every day, unless you write, you're not going to write good stuff. And there's plenty of bad stuff that I've written. As I, my first book, if you look at the early drafts, they're quite ghastly. And you know, one day I will have to re destroy the original records and the original files because when I'm close to dying, I will do that because I don't want anybody to find it and discover that this is how I wrote that book initially. Um, but that's the thing, right? It's a process, which is that like people, and I say this often, which is that there's this romantic notion. And I myself at one point had that, which was that you sit down and the writing flows to you some, like some sort of divine gift. It's not like that. You're like a carpenter. You have to sit down with your tools and you have to keep hammering away. That's the only way you get good writing out. And your writing evolves over, over the years. There are, there are sentences in sections of my first book that now I look at and I'm like, you know, could have been a shorter sentence or could have been crafted better, etc. Because, you know, I've changed in the, in the years that have elapsed. I have changed. So I think writing is like any other job in that sense. There is no romance attached to writing. There's a lot of hours you have to put in. And for me, that's usually broken into two cycles. One is the research cycle, which is my last research cycle was still late last year where I was in London, parked in London for a year and something. And that was 12 hours a day or 10 hours a day in the library, day in, day out, day in, day out. Of course, every four weeks I would allow myself a holiday somewhere in Europe. So I'd disappear for three days and do nothing other than holiday and, and champagne and things like that. But uh, that there's no getting away from. So those cycles are very isolating and very lonely because all you're surrounded by is books and silence. Um, but once that is done, then you have your whole lit fest season, which is again more champagne than books actually. And then you go out and do uh, a lot of talking like this and you... You know, for all the silence you've maintained for one year, you managed to get it all out in uh, three months at these lit fests. Then, of course, the writing phase is a different one altogether, where again you have to tie yourself to a desk and basically just, you know, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite challenging. It can take its toll on you, it can kill some of your social relationships, it can have a little bit of an effect. But the thing is, if this is what you've chosen to do, you, you want to do it well, right? Which means if, who else is going to sacrifice it other than you? Nobody else is going to come and write for you. So you, there's no other way than. Uh, putting in the hours and sitting down and doing it yourself. So it's in that sense, it's like any other job. There's no uh, you know sentimental sense of oh I'm a writer. You know I will sit at my desk and look at the sky and be inspired. It doesn't work that way. Hi Manu. Uh, I just want to ask you. So uh, I mean you brought out a point about how uh, I mean what your sources are when you when you write or you bring out certain nuances in history like reading certain parliament reports or. So I want to understand, I mean, uh, those are, of course, you'll have government records and, you know, to bring out certain events or something that would have, that you brought out in your book. But something like uh, some nuances about what a courtesan did, you know, in the in the Mughal times or something in the Bahamani Sultan time. How do you, w I mean, where, what are those kind of sources you would tap on to, you know, bring out these nuances? How easy are they to So find the advantage image? with courtesans especially is that often they've left a lot of literature. And that literature often tells you a lot. In the Indian tradition, usually when a poet, uh, so even in the Bhakti tradition, for example, when they write, their voice and their name is often woven into the into the the poetry that they've created. So in the 18th century, for example, there is uh, there was a poet, and she appears in the book called Muddu Parni, who wrote basically sensuous poetry. And uh, this, in her own day, the Maratha kings of Tanjore basically celebrated her and thought of her as a as a great uh, poet and a great leader, etc. Of course, uh, into the 19th century, once our brains were infected with the Victorian bug, what happened is that they started pretending that all this erotic poetry couldn't come from a woman. So they said that, oh, no, 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 this wasn't written by Muddu Palni, it was written by Muddu Pillai, like a man. Uh, then, of course, uh, Devadasi published her work, the book got banned. But that poem, that, that sensuality that she brings into it, before that, she's got a little preamble where she explains who she is. So she gives her genealogy, her grandmother, her mother, herself. She lists out her accomplishments with great confidence. And that gives you, that leaves you no suspicion of, you know, even if she's exaggerating. The point is that, and her, the, the fact that her, her work has survived, and the fact that it was written under royal patronage basically gives you a sense that this was a woman of some importance. So then from there, you can work backwards and try and figure out where she's coming from. You can uh, analyze the poetry for its own elements. So she's, for example, as of now, she seems to be the first woman who's written about women's physicality. So in the Radhika Santana movie, which she wrote, uh, it's 
it's not sensuous in the sense that all the earlier Telugu poems are all about kings and how you know they were so virile and they had so many wives and concubines and girlfriends and things like that. Here, Radha is the is the protagonist, and Radha basically gets upset when Krishna marries uh, you know a woman with a body as soft as bananas. That's the description in the poem, and Radha gets angry. So basically, Krishna has to come and appease her. And in this poem, basically Radha def- demands a lot of physical satisfaction as well. So much so that in one dialogue, Krishna basically says that even when I'm tired, she doesn't listen. She jumps onto bed and begins the game of love. You know, so he's basically saying I'm exhausted, but she's like, no, you can't be. So you know, that's the kind of voice she's bringing in there, and that gives you a sense of her originality, what she was thinking, etc. And you connect it to the larger trend of Telugu poetry, and you look at the larger picture of Telugu poetry, you start realizing where she's unique, where she subscribes to an older tradition, and that helps you carve out her space in that picture. But now, increasingly, history is not merely looking at records of battles and what they of their royal decrees or whatever. It's looking at what was happening on the ground with the people. It was looking at what's happening with architecture. It's looking at what's happening with literature. It's looking also at what's happening with movement of people. You know, this uh, the the Marathas in Tanjore had Afghan uh, generals, Bundelas and Rajputs and people like that serving with them in Tamil Nadu. You know, it was possible already in the 18th century to live like that. Elites in India had a vast uh, appetite for mobility, and that mobility is interesting. It tells you that this notion that you know people lived in their villages happily that's been nicely debunked by a scholar called John Wilson. This Gandhian notion that India lived in her villages and villages were self-sustaining republics is unhistorical. In reality, villages were well linked to various networks of trade, etc. It was after the British dismantled earlier industries, dismantled earlier networks that existed. People had no option but to give up their industries and their crafts and come back to the village and become dependent on land. So this big national romance we have with the self-reliant village is also not historical. So you look at all these things, different sources, not merely what's on paper. And let, let's be very clear about one thing: what's on paper also privileges people who are able to write. So you look at uh, lower caste history; often it, that is in song and folklore, and not in in records and documents, because they didn't have access to records and documents. Only if you look at all of that, you get a full picture. And that I think is is an exercise that's actually very fun, because you discover these gems in Indian history, and then you can write books of essay like this. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh. Uh, this question is about uh, we hear a lot about indian historians being uh, on the left and the leftist historians and i i think arun shaudhary has written a book on that as well eminent historians i'm sure you must have read it so what are your views on that i mean uh, is there a, i mean is there a credible reason why this we hear a lot especially now with the current political dispensation and uh, a certain uh, few you mentioned that you know you cannot be 100% objective so uh, is there a credible reason for this i think that i mean credible reason again sounds too like as though i'm making a categorical statement but yes there are there are people who lean certain ways there are people who lean this way there are people who lean that way as i said at the end of the day history is also discipline which is constantly engaging in dialogue which is that one historian comes up with something equally someone else would connect its dots right you're connecting it this way i'm connecting it th- this way you can't change the dots when you change the dots you're not a historian then that is something else that's cuckoo that's just you know i mean that that's my issue with a, a lot of you know vociferous twitter historians who will happily say that you know plastic uh, you know head transplant existed in ganapati's age and so on that is not the genius of indian history the genius of indian history there's so much you know harappan's had toilets on the first floor that is the genius you know having 3000 4000 years ago having underground drainage and toilets on the first floor having no kings the harappans had no kings because kings tend to leave monuments and palaces and statues there are no monuments in, in the harappan ruins cities a thousand miles apart have the same format the same planning the same structure a big house is a, a rectangle that's large a small house is a rectangle that's small everything is organized at this at this level and it's fascinating to even speculate as to what kind of social order they had was it a an elite that controlled them rather than one king was it you know some sort of uh, some variant of a socialist system that controlled their society you know there are theories so you know often what happens is the politics infects these things you know th- to a certain extent but what also matters is that how are you going about in being as far as possible true to the science of how you connect those dots that is important there there can be no excuses so for example if you read a text now a right wing historian will read a text a left wing historian will read a text your job as a historian is not to take any text at face value so uh, um, an invading mahmud of guri will say that you know he's got text where he says i give 20000 infidels on a daily basis for 5 years or something like that 
but he's writing in arabic and persian who's he writing for for an islamic audience in the west he's trying to impress them saying i am look i'm such a great uh, killer of infidels give me legitimacy he's trying to build legitimacy that way in reality he's inscribing his coins with lakshmi's image because otherwise the so called infidels are not going to buy his coins they're not going to let him rule so he knows where to make his compromises so often what you say in theory or on in in text is not how you act on the ground and we don't really need to go into the past even now that's the case right you find that on paper we have the most wonderful laws in the world you know so much the caste does not exist for example but caste exists very much in reality on paper it doesn't but it exists so the point is there is that that difference so you never take any record or any document at face value everything documents were usually patronized by kings and queens usually they were meant to be instruments of propaganda so you have the option of being carried away saying oh my god this this king you know had 5000 poets singing for him every day or you say hold on he's probably exaggerating because this is what kings do to show up their own legitimacy they try and project a superhuman image but in that process allowing your politics to sort of come in and uh, decide how you're going to interpret that is i think the 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 tricky thing there is a leftist method which i think the advantage it's brought is that you look at history not merely as kings and queens but also from below and i think that is a useful perspective to have but also equally denying completely you know a, a certain uh, class of kings for example saying oh they were sitting on top of a caste order therefore they were all bad or they don't deserve a certain thing caste order was the was the thing at the time we have to understand it we have to dismantle it we have to you know get our head around it but again as i said we are not here to judge the people who existed in that order we just have to understand that this is what happened at that time on its own terms you understand the past on its own terms or at least you try some of your politics will influence you some of your own ideas will influence you but you make your your best effort and i think there there the politics can slowly uh, withdraw and you can finally reach something that resembles the truth back back to the topic of the week uh, 370 yeah. okay i'll speak fast let's, let's, okay let's. back to the topic of the yeah. week 370 <clears throat> i think you took a i mean you articulated that it had to be done but um you know you didn't really agree with the way it was done and you also have very close not agree more uncomfortable yeah uncomfortable. as i said i'm not i mean also i'm not you, i don't know what they are thinking or what their picture is you also have insight is. into how parliament worked and you know what happens on tv and what happens do you really believe that the previous governments even had the intention of you know getting you know solving 370 I don't think it depends on your priorities right for them I think normalizing the relationship was something so which is why I think in UPA2 for example they had these record tourism numbers they record uh, the lowest number of terror attacks and lowest number of instances of violence and things like that over then for them I think they were normalizing it in that sense I don't think they thought that this is something that can go and I believe there are several court judgments which basically say that over time basically this has become a permanent feature of the constitution so I think at some level there was some sort of basically sitting back saying acha this is how it is and we're just going to work with what we have what you see now is saying no this is not how it is and this was a manifesto promise of theirs saying that we are not going to allow this to be the case we're going to dismantle this so there's one set of parties that were allow- willing to let it happen and to work within the existing uh, rules and structure that had already been created another set of parties said no these rules and by themselves they're not fair we're going to dismantle them so i think they're looking at it from two different perspectives but the kind of support it's received in parliament across party lines suggests that on an emotional level this seems to have resonated with large numbers of people and you know at the end of the day if your mps are voting for it it's legitimate it is legal it is how it is as i said my only discomfort is the is the potential legal gymnastics where the consent of the state has been taken from the governor when the state assembly is suspended the assembly does it's been dissolved so that for me is tricky territory because you're saying you've got consent of the state but that's through a that's you're reading the letter of the law, law right but you're not actually reading the spirit right for me in a historical sense it sets the wrong precedent which is what worries me it's not the event by itself that worries me it's what this this method of reaching that conclusion is what that portends for the future um have you settled on an idea for your phd dissertation <laughs> why do you ask <laughs> this is an ominous question i do i do have a topic but uh, that has nothing to do with my books it's uh, and i've already finished one year of my phd my I, i'm here this year for for family reasons so you know now my phd i'm on leave from my phd but when i go back yes i intend to resume a rather dull subject and to finish that and sort of hammer it out in due course yeah 
Hi Manu. So in your book you talk. I remember you. We met at that voting booth. We did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you do. Uh, so uh, I read your book, and a lot of it talks about how there are shades to characters. How every character is not black and white. You talk about British lords, and you talk about uh, Churchill vouching for Savarkar's release to the French, and then there's the bit about Kabir being misogynistic. Right, um, uh, having been misogynistic, not being misogynistic. Versus. At a certain point, there are verses which yeah. can be deeply troubling. But equally, like all saints and sadhus and swamis, he basically said contradictory things. So one place he'll say something that sounds extremely misogynistic. Right. Elsewhere, he'll say something right. that's and the same opposite. Same with Vivekananda, yeah. like being being um, consistency is not what saints did. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, uh, so you see them as a product of their times. You see them in that context. Can can we extend the same luxury to uh, people in this day and age where? You see a lot of artists or someone falling from grace, and where they're completely cancelled, their legacy is completely tarnished. So, can we? Is it right? Is it morally right to consume art from a morally reprehensible artist? Yeah, I have I have reservations about that. For example, uh, during Me Too, there were some there were one or two instances, and some of the older feminists basically came out and were seen to be standing with the perpetrator rather than with the victim. And there was this social media sort of outrage where basically they said, "Oh, these women are these people are not feminists anymore. All of this has been cancelled," which I don't think is fair. They three decades or four decades of their work is what we are standing on today. So we or today's feminists often have a lot that they can say because these people have laid the ground. You cannot cancel out three, four decades of uh, of of work on the basis of one opinion that you don't agree with. That for me is fundamentally illiberal. That for me, th this whole moral, I am morally right. For me, it reminds me of the Victorians who came here and said we are going to civilize India because we are right. They were so convinced that they were right. They did more damage to this country than they did good. They didn't civilize the country. They took us back in some way in our head. You know. So anybody who's making these ultra moral statements. i find them really uh, uncomfortable and i have reservations about that and i agree that you know you can't cancel out people's work on the basis of uh, what's happening now or you know individual errors etc for me i'm okay with separating the art from the artist to a certain extent unless of course the artist is egregious and repeatedly has a history of uh, doing this but that way you have to cancel a lot of history i mean you find lots of writers who are often helped by their wives uh, you find a lot of uh, kings who are helped by their wives and nicely you know the famous example of jahangir where you know he was his own son cast him as an complete opium addict who was a puppet in the hands of noor jahan etc whereas in reality it was a more equal partnership but it made sense for shah jahan to make himself look better he made his father look like a wimp and his stepmother look like some sort of evil genius so you know women are treated badly that way so there are if you start looking at that lots of the work done by lots of men will get cancelled out because their women have not been given their due and you see this in science you see this in art you see this in many places so you know there this cancelling out business on the basis of the current moral opinions is a tricky and slippery slope hai jo mahatma aur the other mahatma as you said gone on to live to be 150 instead of 125 you would be alive today uh, in which city would you put him in this auditorium or sabarmati or kashmir le <laughs> and would you like him to be the voice of your book what would be his thoughts on amazon and oh my god <laughs> tricky question you know the picture i have in my mind is a few years ago there was this um, india against corruption movement right anna hazare and everybody said this is like a messiah this is the new gandhi of the 21st century etc in 5 years done nobody really uh, gives him that kind of respect anyone they're not making a moral statement but he's not really given that kind of uh, esteem he suddenly enjoyed in that in that particular season and i have a feeling that we would have treated gandhi ji similarly and he would have potentially gone back to becoming a slightly eccentric old man writing op-eds about his bowel movements which he did and about his various uh, experiments on various subjects and would have you know very like i have a feeling he would have faded away gone to sabarmati the ashram people would have gone there to touch his feet every time they came into power forgotten about him for the next 5 years gone back to delhi and that's about it and i don't think he'd have been sitting here he'd have been sitting in sabarmati possibly writing op-eds on his bowel movements i i would like to understand the sources of uh, information you get because i see you speak about uh, telugu and uh, malayalam and urdu so how do you get the sources because now today in the uh, educational field everybody is moving towards uh, english as a medium of instruction so what do you think about this i would like to understand it, it depends on the topic so for example my first book was entirely set in the colonial period so i was lucky that 85% of the primary records were in english but i can speak Mar malayalam i can read and write marathi and i can read and write hindi so i can do that much now in european countries if you're doing say if you're a french historian working in france 
you need to know French to be able to go through the records. In a country like ours, you can't learn all the languages. I mean, it's impossible. I mean, it, I want to study Telugu literature. I go to the 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 VN Rao, David Shulman, those translations, which are the latest and the best in the field, rather than having to learn Telugu for 20 years. Because then tomorrow, if I want to do something in Rajasthan, we'll have to learn dialects from there. You know, it's difficult in India, but it helps as far as possible if you have access to the primary material. Because frankly, anything that's translated, one level of a filter has come on it. And there it's tricky because, you know, you often find translations can be tricky in this book. And I'll probably end on this anecdote. Uh, if you look at the original story of Shakuntala, we have this, the general story of Shakuntala that is known as... Uh, Shakuntala was there. One day Dushanta comes. He says, ah, beautiful woman, you know, with wonderful thighs, etc. Lie with me. She says, oh, you know, she's blushing and she's shy and they finally agree. And then when he goes, he gives her a ring. Uh, she gets pregnant. Uh, eventually she wants to come uh, to him. Suddenly one day a sage appears. Her head is in the clouds. Sage says, Yo, whoever you're thinking about, he's going to forget you. Then all her dasis run to the sage saying, Ayo, you know, poor girl, please don't do this. So then the sage says, fine, when you show the king the ring, he'll remember you. Naturally, the ring gets lost. She comes. The king doesn't rec recognize her. She eventually goes. End of story. He eventually finds the ring via a fish, etc. And that's the story. But this is not the original Shakuntala. This is Kalidasa Shakuntala, the Abhinyana Shakuntala. This is not the original Shakuntala. The original Shakuntala of the epics has a completely different trajectory. Here Dushanta comes and he says, Oh, lie with me, beautiful woman of beautiful thighs or whatever. She says, fine, there are no maids. She's not coy and shy and, uh, you know, unable to talk to a man and all that. She's very direct. And she extracts from him a promise Right at the start. She says, if I sleep with you, my son must be the heir to your kingdom. He says, fine. Then she has a peculiar 36-month pregnancy. And then she takes her son. Her son is born. She takes the son to the king's court. There is no ring. There is no fish. There is no curse. In this story, the king deliberately lies. When Shakuntala shows up, he says, well, you know, in, in, in court, if this stray woman shows up with a child and claims it's mine, how can I, you know, I lose face in front of my courtiers. So he lies and Shakuntala doesn't cry and weep and go away. She stands there and she says that even without you, my son will rule all the three worlds. You may rule the earth, but I fly the sky. She stands there with great confidence and fury and says this. Then a magical voice from the heaven says, no, no, Shakuntala is telling the truth. Dushanta, you better own up. And Dushanta says, fine, you know, I, was, I made a mistake. And I forgive Shakuntala for her harsh words because patriarchy is as old as any Indian tradition. And uh, that is a story in the original Shakuntala. She's much more direct and forthright. She extracts, a, uh, in this transaction between them, she extracts a promise. Her son must be king. She's very forthright. Now, why is it that we are more familiar with the second Shakuntala? It is translation. Because what happened is in the late 18th century, the Orientalists who came to India and first translated our, our epics. So William Jones translates uh, Shakuntala's work, well, the Kalida Shakuntala. And he, to begin with, censors a lot. So in the Kalida Shakuntala, and I've told this in my last session also, there's a, so there are sections where uh, she's sad, so her face is sad, her shoulders are sort of uh, drooping and her breasts are sagging. And William Jones translates it where he includes the face and the shoulders, but he leaves out the breasts. Because for his audience in the West, he's not comfortable with anything that's even remotely sensuous or sexual. With the result that this Shakuntala that he translated to English comes back to us in our textbooks and in our books. And we have internalized that sanitized, censored Shakuntala as our Shakuntala. Whereas in reality, we have two versions of Shakuntala. One who's quite forthright and direct and the other who's this coy uh, Kalidas Shakuntala. So translation there played a little bit of politics, right? So every time you're dealing with a translated uh, resource, you have to be conscious that this may not be the complete picture. You are basically looking at it through somebody else's eyes. But for practical purposes, it's, uh, it's pretty much impossible to learn 29, 30 languages and then do Indian history. So for practical purposes, you have to concede that you know, at some level, you're going to have to use translations. As far as possible, use primary material. But when you do use translations, have the humility to say that there may be errors in your work and it may be revised by someone better in a better book sometime in the future. Thank you again for listening and thank you for your patience, including at the beginning. Uh, thanks, Manu. Um, that was fun and uh, insightful. And uh, the book is available. There, there are copies of the book here. Um, Thanks, thanks all for coming, and I hope to see you again soon. Just one announcement. Uh, tomorrow we have a film screening at the NFAI. Um, it's a film called His Father's Voice. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an independent film uh, with music by Vedant Bharadwaj. He performed at the Loft uh, 
last year with Ankit Chadha. And uh, it's, a, it's a film on, on, on dance and music, and it's set in Tamil Nadu. And um, it's the, the director, uh, the producer, and the lead, lead dancer and lead, lead actor is uh, from Pune, uh, Ashwin, Ashwini Pawar, and her husband is the, is the director of the film. So tomorrow morning at 10.45 at the NFAI Auditorium, you're most welcome to come. It will be great to see you. Manu, thanks so much for making this, and uh, let's do it again. Happily. Thanks. <laughs>